So here we are, our last session on Islam. We've posed this question before, haven't we? The question you see on this opening slide. It's the question someone asks in the Acts of the Apostles in the uh, Christian New Testament. And the answer he's given by St. Paul is that he must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, says Paul. But we paused, as you'll remember, a few sessions ago to consider how some of the other religions we're studying might answer that question. Whether it's Hindus recommending we pursue one of the four margas, or Buddhists telling us we should follow the Noble Eightfold Path, or Confucians pointing out the spiritual advantages of good etiquette, or Taoists insisting that we need to be and not do. Today, we come to a religion, or rather one dimension or spiritual movement within a religion, which suggests that if we want to be saved, we should dance. Well, well, as you know, or should know from your reading in Paths of Return, that's putting things a little bit too simplistically. There's a good deal more to the story than that, and we need to put that provocative claim in its context. I've made a distinction in Paths of Return between two groups with two parties each, as it were. <laughs> I've made a distinction between political Muslims and spiritual Muslims. The horizontal, uh, political, red distinction on the slide between Sunnis and Shiites, and the vertical, spiritual, green distinction between Sufis and Shariites. Let's review what I had to say in Paths of Return uh, with, as usual, some elaboration. First of all, the political uh, distinction, the horizontal distinction between, as I call them, denominations of Muslims. There are two main groups of Muslims in the world. The Sunnis, by far the largest group, and the Shiites. Sunni comes from the Arabic term Sunnah, meaning tradition. These are the traditionalists. Shiite comes from the Arabic term Shia, meaning the party, those who are partisans of the uh, Prophet's son-in-law and one of his four companions, Ali. The difference here, as I explained in what you read, is rather like the difference between the distinction between within Christianity, the Orthodox Church, and Roman Catholic Christians. The Orthodox say that Jesus gave equal authority to all 12 apostles and their successors and their successors' successors down through the centuries, the bishops of the church, should together in council have a kind of consensus and together provide authority for the rest of the Christians. Roman Catholics, by contrast, say no. One person in particular, Peter, the apostle Peter, was given unique authority by Christ. Well, the Shiites are more like that. They say it was one of the companions, the prophet's son-in-law Ali, who was given complete authority. And the Sunnis say, no, 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 no. We believe, well, like Orthodox Christians, that authority was diversified and divided among, well, Muhammad didn't have 12 apostles, but he did have four companions, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. And the Sunnis say each of them has authority, and their successors are called the caliphs, the caliphs. Those are the people who ought to be leading and providing authority and making decisions and judgments with respect to the, the, uh, the history of Islam. And the Shiites say, no, it's Ali. There's an interesting twist here, as I mentioned again in, in Paths of Return. Uh, Shiites divide up into different groups. The largest group are called Twelver Shiites. And that's because they believe the twelfth successor to Ali... Um, the, the successors are all called imams among the Shiites. The twelfth of those successors went into hiding. He went into what they call ghibat. Do you see my asterisk there? Or occultation. He's still alive. He was born centuries ago. He's a very old man now, but he's still alive. He's living in hiding right now. I put in a bracket there down at the bottom. You might think about Lao Tzu, right? who the Taoists say maybe never actually died, still alive on the planet someplace. Um, also think about the very ending of the Gospel of John, 
where Peter and Jesus have a conversation, and Jesus says to Peter, well, you know, John may tarry, and some people have interpreted that to mean that John is actually still alive on the planet. Well, this imam, the hidden imam, the twelfth imam, is rather like that. And these twelver Shiite Muslims say, the hidden imam will reemerge into public, will manifest himself again in the world, make himself known at the end of the world, when he will take the name Muhammad al-Mahdi. He will have the name of the prophet Muhammad. He also will be named Muhammad, but he will be called the al-Mahdi. Do you see that word here? That means the rightly guided one. And he will have, interestingly enough, the same role that John the Baptist had with respect to Christ's first coming. Well, this Muhammad al-Mahdi will have that kind of same kind of preparatory role to play vis-a-vis Christ's second coming. Do you remember I've told you Muslims agree with Christians? It's Jesus who will return at the end of history to judge the world. It's not the prophet Muhammad, but this Muhammad, this Muhammad al-Makti, will, as it were, prepare the way for that uh, second coming or return of Christ to the world. So the Shiites have this very interesting subgroup, these Twelvers, that have this, uh, that have this perspective. Well, here's a, a little slide that I pulled off of a Shiite website uh, talking about the arrival, the coming of the Mahdi. And as, there, as is the case in Christianity, where people for centuries have been predicting the end of the world and the return of Christ, and then he hasn't showed up, <laughs> Shiites historically have often been eager to um, promote and, and predict and say this is when the Mahdi is actually going to return to the world. So the coming of the Mahdi is a really, really important um, concept for the Shiite Muslim. Here's a map showing you distribution in the world of Shiite and Sunni uh, Islam. And as you can see, again, the Sunnis are much, much larger group. Um, Shiites primarily in Iran and Iraq, as you can see the darker green on this map. And the lighter green shows uh, countries with a predominant Sunni <coughs> Muslim population. All right, let's turn to the vertical distinction between two different spiritual dimensions of Islam. And the distinction here, as you know, is between Shariites and Sufis. The word Shariite coming from the Arabic term Sharia. As you know, Sharia is the Arabic term meaning law. It's more or less the equivalent of the Jewish Hebrew concept of Torah and equivalent too to the Sanskrit um, term Dharma for both Hindus and Buddhists. So Sharia and Torah and Dharma meaning much the same thing. And then Sufis, the word Sufi, nobody's really sure. It may come from the word Suf, which means wool. Uh, apparently, the early Sufis wore very coarse woolen garments. Um, they were very ascetical and very self-disciplined, and they wanted to reject the refinements and the silk and so forth of the, of the rich people, and they wanted to dress very poorly in wool. But it may also come from the Arabic term Safa, which would uh, mean purity, and which would obviously be what they were seeking to acquire, namely purity of heart. Well, the distinction here, again, is between a more outward and a more inward Islam, an exoteric dimension, uh, an exoteric and an esoteric dimension of Islam. The exoteric being more focused on, as it were, the letter of the law, and the esoteric, the Sufis, being more concerned with the inward dimension, as it were, the spirit of the Sharia. I remind you here with my asterisk of the text in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians that I'm building on here, where Paul talks about God having made him and others uh, ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. The letter, says Paul, killeth, the spirit giveth life. Well, Sufis would be the first to agree with that sentiment. Sufism is Islamic mysticism, right? Sufism is the Muslim form of mysticism, and I talked a bit about that in Paths of Return. Mysticism, mystic, mystical, those words in English derive from the Greek word mu'in. Mu'in, it's an infinitive form of a verb, which means to close either your eyes or your mouth, or both, right? So I mu'in my eyes, I mu'in my mouth when I close them. So by extension, the implication here is that the mystic is somehow able to make contact, is able to know, is able to perceive or experience things 
without using his eyes, while his eyes are closed. Indeed, while all of his natural senses are, as it were, closed or shut down. So he doesn't have to use his eyes or his ears or his nose, doesn't have to use his five senses to know things. But what he knows, these non-empirical uh, things that he knows, things he knows without using his senses, he can't communicate really fully to the rest of us who aren't mystics. It's as though his mouth is closed. Now, not literally. His mouth has not been like wired shut. But he can't talk about it because the experiences that, he've ha that he's had are ineffable, ineffable, unspeakable. He's had non-empirical, ineffable contact with and knowledge of higher levels of reality. That's um, a handy dandy, maybe uh, sort of in a nutshell definition of mysticism, what the mystic entails. I pointed out in the reading that mysticism is a Western religious phenomenon. So there are Jewish and Christian and Sufi mystics, and they are rather like um, Taoists and Zen Buddhists and yogis in that they're seeking and they're trying to apprehend a level or a dimension of the divine and the spiritual world, which other Jews and other Christians and, and other Muslims either don't care about, don't have any desire for, or don't have any access to. So mysticism, I've called again, a Western phenomenon with a kind of Asian flavor to it. The Jewish, the Christian, and the Sufi mystic are trying to uh, enter into a very a direct contact with God, with the divine, and to become, as it were, participants in the divine in much the same way that a yogi is seeking um, to experience moksha and liberation, and the Buddhist is seeking nirvana. Um, this is the same sort of thing that you find in, in Western mysticism. Uh, I give you three terms here. You know what Sufism means already with respect to Islam. Jewish mysticism uh, is often uh, uh, focused on in the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah. Christian mysticism, there are many, many different forms of these different mystical traditions and movements in these Western religions. But one of the most interesting is um, an Eastern Christian form of mysticism called hesychasm. Hesychasm, Kabbalah Jewish, hesychasm Christian, Sufism, the Islamic form. Well, I'll follow my arrow. Now I jumped ahead just a bit. If you want to know more, a couple of very interesting books. Um, the one on the left about Jewish mysticism called The Universal Meaning of the Kabbalah. And then on the right, uh, a very interesting kind of autobiographical book, um, a letter, a, a collection of letters and advice to his spiritual children from a very, very important 20th century Christian hesychast writer, Elder Joseph the Hesychast. That, by the way, on the cover of the book is the little hut or hermitage that this man lived in uh, on Mount Athos in Greece. He lived for many, many years in this little cell, as they call them, or little hut on Mount Athos. So a couple of books if you wanted to go further into Jewish or Christian mysticism. To continue this slide, backing up to this slide again, exoteric Jews, exoteric Christians, exoteric Sufis, uh, Muslims, in other words, Christians and Muslims and uh, and Jews who aren't any don't have any interest in these kind of higher levels of knowledge or uh, experiencing things in some sort of non-empirical or spiritual way they have tended historically to be very very suspicious of the Jewish uh, of the uh, of the mystics among them uh, the suspicion in some cases has resulted in condemnation in some cases in execution. <laughs> The Sufi sage, my asterisk hit, come down to the bottom of the slide, the Sufi sage Mansur al-Halaj made the mistake of publicly saying, and you see next to his name, that's an Arabic phrase, anal haq, anal haq. He said anal haq. Well, what that means in Arabic is, I am the truth, with a capital T, haq means truth. I am the truth. Well, now why did he say that? Well, because he had he felt as though he had completely and totally, as it were, um, abandoned and left behind Mansur al-Halaj and been merged with and completely joined with God. So he was speaking as if he were Allah. But you don't do that, <laughs> at least not in public, when you're surrounded by exoteric, outwardly thinking, 
uh, letter of the law sort of Muslims, because what they're going to say is you've committed the worst of all sins. You've committed shirk. You've not only identified something with God, associated something with Allah, you've associated yourself with Allah. So what did they do to Mansur al-Halaj? They crucified him. They actually scraped all of his skin off. Yikes. They flayed him, and then they crucified him. And famously, he is said to have said, hanging there on a cross, his disciples were all gathered around, and they were lamenting and weeping, and his last words were, study yourselves. All right. Well, so mysticism is not very popular among uh, outward, uh, literally based sort of uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. I, I say here, um, sometimes somebody has said this kind of as a joke, I guess, from the outward exoteric perspective, mysticism is really mist eye schism. It begins in mist, it centers on I, and it ends in schism, ends in division among people. Well, that's the outward critique of Sufism and Kabbalah and Hezekasm. Mysticism, I wanted to connect it back, as I did in the reading, with the levels of participation, right, that we talked about early on this in this course. So I say here, mysticism, whether Jewish or Christian or Muslim, presupposes belief, which we've defined as acceptance of truth on authority. It presupposes faith, which goes a bit further, right? Faith is what we've called trust in God, commitment to God, um, adapting your whole life, your lifestyle to your belief in God. But mysticism goes even further in seeking an experience of God in the here and now. Somebody has said Sufis and also Christian and Jewish mystics want heaven now, right? In this world, they want to experience that right now in this life. And then they go even further, mystics go even further in seeking a total transformation leading to, and I'm going to go back and use this phrase that I used uh, before in this class from Second Peter, leading to a participation in or a share in God's very nature. The second uh, box on this slide, I'm quoting from the man in a book of saints whose writings I've asked you to read uh, in this module, the Sheikh Ahmed al-Alawi. You're reading a couple of things, actually. One uh, by a doctor, a physician who cared for him, and then also some of his own writing as well. What does he say? He says, quote, faith is necessary for religions, but it ceases to be so for those who go further and to achieve what he calls self-realization in God. Then one no longer believes because one sees. There's no longer any need to believe when one sees the truth. So seeing, I take to be the equivalent of step three, level three experience. And what he's calling here self-realization, I take to be equivalent to step four, which is transformation. Let's just go back quickly to make sure that we're plugging all this in and remind you of the slides that I used early on when I first talked about these four different levels. So belief, right, mental acceptance, um, comparing it to a trusting a map as you go toward a distant city that you've never been to, or hearing about fire. Remember these analogies? So Smokey Bear tells you there's fire, uh, danger today, you don't know what fire is, but you're going to accept what Smokey says. Remember that? And then faith, a commitment to the truth of the idea that changes your lifestyle, analogous to journeying to the city with someone who's already been there, and it's like seeing smoke from the fire off on the horizon. And then experience goes even further. This is stage three, direct perception. This is what the mystic is seeking, direct perception of the reality behind the idea that you accept at the earlier levels. And that's like arriving at a city or maybe like feeling the heat of the fire, like being right up close to those flames, right? And then finally, transformation. Uh, the asterisk reminds us this is the level of complete uh, sanctity or sagacity. This is the highest level of all where the person comes to share in the divine reality behind the idea, like settling down in the city you've journeyed to or being engulfed or inflamed by the fire. And this was the image I used again uh, quite a number of sessions ago to um, emblemize, symbolize, represent the highest goal where a person becomes a flame, as it were, with God. 
Another way to think about this, some concentric circles, put God at the center in the center circle, and you've got an outer circle, belief, then coming inward, a circle of faith, coming further inward, a circle of experience, and then finally the inner transformation. Well, the mystic, right, here's where mysticism resides, it's this uh, purple arrow. It wants to pierce, traverse, go all the way down, 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 right to the center. That's what the mystic is seeking to do with his spiritual life. All right, back to Sufism in particular. Sufism, again, Islamic mysticism, Muslim mysticism. I said in the reading, I wanted to reassert here, the genuine forms of Sufism are always founded upon the Islamic Sharia. They always presuppose that you have uh, recited in sincerity the Shahada and that you're practicing the other pillars of Islam. Um, you're engaged in almsgiving and praying five times a day and you make the fast during Ramadan and hopefully you're able to make the pilgrimage, the Hajj to Mecca. And I put in a bracket here, you go on the internet, you'll find all kinds of people calling themselves Sufis. I call them here New Age or Pseudo-Sufis, but true Sufism is always rooted in uh, Islam. I say in the second line in red, there's a necessity for the Sufi to be traditionally grounded, same thing in Sharia, and for a Sufi seeker, a man or woman who's seeking to pursue this mystical path, to have the one-on-one -on -one guidance of a particular person, a spiritual master who's actually able to direct you and guide you. The Sufi disciple is called a fakir. Uh, the word fakir in Arabic means someone who's poor, a poor one. And I called your attention to a parallel here in uh, Christ's Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 3, where he speaks of the poor being blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, not poor necessarily in terms of your wallet or bank account. It's a poverty, an inward poverty, where one doesn't claim to be anything, have anything, be anything special. So it's basically radical humility. If you're a Sufi, you join a tariqa. Tariqa in Arabic means path. Uh, we could simply call it a spiritual brotherhood. A uh, true Sufi is always part of a group, doesn't try to go off on his or her own to achieve this, this mystical um, transformation. You're part of a group, a tariqa. Here I compare it to Christian monasticism. So Christian men, monks, and women, nuns, will join monasteries. Uh, they're also spiritual brotherhoods, sisterhoods. And tariqas are sort of like that, except notice minus celibacy. So a monk, a Christian monk, a, a Christian nun, uh, take a vow to be celibate, not to get married, not to have children, uh, to live sexually pure and celibate lives. And in Islam, it's quite different. Sufis are usually actually married, family people with children and so forth. Someone has said, I like this actually, Sufism is the democratic theocracy of married monks. <laughs> so a theocracy, right, is um, a society that's ruled by God. God is at the head. God's the supreme authority. But Sufism, this person has said, is a democratic theocracy insofar as there still is deliberation among people and a deference to other people's authority, human authority as well as the divine authority. And then the uh, theocratic democracy of married monks, because they live rather like Christian monks and they're seeking an intense spiritual discipline, seeking the spiritual a mystical transformation and so forth, but they're not, they're not celibate. So they're not, they're not really monks, they're married monks to have that analogy. If you're a Sufi, you're a fakir, you're a member of a tariqa, and you're in obedience to, you're under the authority of a sheikh, which literally in Arabic means an old man. But by extension, as with uh, Lao Tzu, as with the other terms that we've looked at before, someone who's wise in years, a spiritual master. Compare that to what a Hindu would call a guru. A true sheikh, a true spiritual master, will always be able to validate his authority by showing you, if you asked for it, his silsala. His silsala, that last uh, word on, the, on this slide, is um, his pedigree, as it were, showing the initiatic chain of transmission that he's received to be a sheikh. So in other words, 
he's going to be able to tell you who his sheikh was and who that sheikh's was and who that sheikh had who who that sheikh's sheikh was all the way all the way back actually to Muhammad himself sufis say these various sufi lineages and tariqas they're part of all of them actually came out of one source one root and that was actually Muhammad so a true sheikh is going to have is going to be a member of one of these chains of transmission called a silsala and will be able to give you his bona fides by showing you uh, if you wanted to find out actually his uh, his pedigree all right and then let's kind of wind this up now come to the conclusion here shortly by talking a little bit about uh, sufi practices i've gone over this pretty extensively in the reading as well but just a few reminders here i talked about three practices in particular and notice my uh, my red arrow over here on the side coming from Sufi practices all the way down over here what the Sufi is seeking ultimately is in Arabic it's referred to as fana which means extinction it has to do with overcoming as it were dissolving the egocentrical knots within us and letting all of that go um, rather like what the Buddhist is seeking with nirvana remember nirvana so the sufi is seeking something nirvana like in seeking fana and once again i've done this now two or three times already in the course i quote from paul's letter to the galatians where he says it's no longer i it's no longer paul's ego that's operative but rather christ who is in him christ who is in me well the sufi is seeking something like that how does he do that three practices first of all invocation rhythmical repetition of the name of god usually of allah but it could be one of the other uh, 99 glorious names of allah this practice in arabic is referred to as dhikr you see d-h-i-k-r that's pronounced dhikr which means literally remembrance and if you go back to um the reading from this Sheikh Ahmed al Alawi in a book of saints. I refer you to some pages here, 108, uh, 109, where he talks about how he was taught this practice of invocation by his Sheikh and how he then taught it to the his own disciples. Uh, the word remembrance reminded me, I should make a comparison here again with Christianity in the Gospel of Luke in instituting the Last Supper, the communion meal with his disciples his apostles christ takes a piece of bread and he says you know you should eat this and then he takes some wine and he says you should drink this and in both cases you do this in remembrance of me that word remembrance in greek and the word remembrance in arabic are very powerful words they mean more than just you know sort of thinking about something or fondly remembering something like i don't know uh, your childhood or when you got married or whatever it might be remembrance really means calling into the present of that which is past it means a kind of uh, exiting time itself as we know it and making contact again with something transcendent in character so Christ says, do this in remembrance of me and Catholics and Orthodox and Anglicans and a number of other Christians would say when you're actually eating that bread and drinking that wine in communion you're really participating in Christ's very body and blood he's really present there in that right well the, the Sufi says God Allah is really present when I invoke his name Allah he actually comes into me and I enter him in this practice of invocation then there's meditation on the name of Allah or one of God's other names and this includes um, as you say the name Allah hearing it with your ears obviously maybe even sensing its reverberation in your chest as you say it and then also and this Sheikh Allah we describes this again in uh, the reading in a book of Saints visualizing the name visualizing those arabic letters of allah picturing the letters in your mind's eye as you say the word and deepening as it were your relationship with that name uh, by that practice and then thirdly the last uh, practice i talked about and now we're circling all the way back to my first slide today you dance um, you engage in rhythmical dance if you're a Sufi in many of the Sufi orders at least you do this the dance is called Hadra um, the word literally in Arabic means presence 
And you can read about this also in the Sheikh's account on page 93. He describes, uh, at least in general terms, how these particular uh, Sufis engage in this dance. The more, um, how do I say this, popular, the best known form of Sufi rhythmical dancing belongs to an order, a tariqa called the Mevlevi uh, tariqa, the Mevlevi dervishes, who go all the way back to a very, very famous medieval Sufi master and poet, Jalaluddin Rumi. And we call them the whirling dervishes because of the particular style of, of dance or rhythmical movement they engage in. So my purple arrow takes me to this screen. Here's another shot, uh, as in the first slide today, of the whirling dervishes of this Mevlevi uh, Sufi order going back to Rumi. I'm posting uh, in this module on the course site, on the Blackboard site, a short clip off of YouTube where you can see um, a little film that was made of these whirling dervishes uh, doing some of their dances. But I also wanted to, to play for you here, I have my little box to remind me, um, an example of how a different tariqa, the Shadaliya Sufi order, what it sounds like when they actually together in unison chant. Now in this case, not the name of Allah, but the Shahada. They do invoke the name of Allah as well in their dhek, but as part of their own uh, style of hudra or uh, spiritual dancing, they also chant the shahada, la ilaha illallah, right? There is no God but God. They do that repeatedly, and they do that to the accompaniment of a drum. And it's a, it's a very interesting sound. So let me just give you a taste of that. I was able, as I mentioned, uh, in uh, Paths of Return to make contact with a particular uh, Sufi order, and it was this Shadaliya Darkawiya order. And I was able to listen to some things and make recordings of things that, well, most people actually can't hear. So let me give you an example of what this sounds like. What you need to do as you listen to this is imagine some things. <laughs> I mean, there's no film of this because this particular order, uh, unlike the Mevlevi dervishes, don't allow anyone, well, except a few people, to see what they're doing to participate in these um, group chanting and dancing. But as they're saying, la ilaha illallah, they're standing vertically, but they're sort of bending at the knees rhythmically and then they'll bow forward and then back up and down with their knees and then bend forward, holding hands in a circle, all in unison. And I must say, it's a very, very powerful thing to watch. Um, it's, uh, it sends uh, vibrations right down to your toes when you, when you hear these people dancing in this particular way and chanting like that. So just a sample of how that order uh, would sound and by imagination, perhaps, you can think how they'd look as they engaged in these uh, mystical dances. All right, let me wrap up. But I wanted to uh, give you a photo here of this Sheikh Ahmed al Alawi that you're reading about in, in, in a book of saints. Um, he was a master, uh, a spiritual master of a Shadaliya Darkawiya Tarika. It's called the Shadaliya because it goes back to a 13th century uh, Sufi master Abu al-Hassan al-Shadali. So it's called the Shadali Tariqa. Darkawi was another Sufi master, I think 18th century, who sort of renewed the order and gave it a new spirit.
spiritual, bit of spiritual energy. Well, this man that you're reading about, you're reading his writing in a book of saints, that's what he looks like, the Sheikh Ahmed al Alawi, died in 1934. I was able, as I mentioned in Paths of Return, to uh, meet one of his uh, main, most important successors, the Sheikh Isa Nurid al-Din, uh, died in 1998, and I had several conversations with this man. I always tell people, <laughs> I would ask this uh, Sheikh a question, and it was almost as though he'd been waiting 50 years for someone to ask him exactly that question, because the answer would just always come like a lightning bolt, almost instantly. You know, you ask most people questions, and they'll pause, and they'll think about it, and they'll ruminate a little bit. But this guy, it was just like an answer would just, you know, bang, emerge from him. And it was always um, a pretty on-target on answer. It always rang true for me. So... I was quite impressed by him. And then also, I was able to meet his successor, um, another sheikh, Sheikh Abu Bakr Siraj Adin, a man whose name in the world, as we say, whose um, name outside of Islam was Martin Lings. He was actually a convert to Islam as a young man. He was a British man, an Englishman. And he was a disciple of this previous sheikh, the Sheikh Isa Nur al-Din, um, and then he became a sheikh in his own right. And he was also extraordinary. If you want to um, hear what I think about him, <laughs> you can go to my website. There's a lecture there on my website. You can actually read it or listen to it. It's called The Sound of a Lecture Undelivered, Jesus and the World's Religions. And I talk about him and the impact that he had on me anyway. Um, yeah, just, uh, this is a saint. I was quite sure he was a saint. He's one of a few people I've met in my life that I would really put in the, in the saintly category. Um, well here, I've, I've done a screenshot of that page on my website. If you go to, um, scholarship, drop down menu, articles and papers, and you can scroll down to the sound of a lecture undelivered and hear me, uh, say a few things about this particular Sufi master and uh, his extraordinary uh, impact on, on many people around him. So that's Sufism.